is such a thing as vain and empty repetition, but there are a lot of kinds of repetition that are actually life-giving yeah, and I mean, deepening. In fact, as you were speaking, I was thinking about the, the Jesus prayer. Yes. I wrote a book uh, a number of years ago, back in 2002. Uh, it hit the top of the bestseller list in cloth-bound books. It was called The Prayer of Jesus. And, of course, I'm talking about the Lord's Prayer. Yes. But in Orthodoxy, I learned a Jesus mm. prayer. And when I was learning about the Jesus prayer, the first, the first thing I thought is, wow, is this what Jesus was talking about when he said, so when you pray, don't keep on babbling like pagans. They think they'll be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask him. And so I'm thinking, is this vain repetition? And I recognize, no. This is not vain repetition. The Jesus prayer, and you just enunciated it, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Some people say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. Uh, there are different variations. Uh, that is part of my DNA now. I, I pray it, I would say, uh, without any hyperbole, hundreds of times a day. So I took a nap before we did this interview um, to kind of build up my strength. and. And uh, as I was drifting off to sleep, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, these were not vain repetitions. I was thinking about the fact that Jesus is Lord, that he is the Son of God, that I am a needy person, I desire his mercy. Yes, yes. That has become my way of calling upon the name of the Lord. It is my way of, of building intimacy with Christ. It's actually the introduction. I'm going to tell you a little story here. I do the Bible Answer Man broadcast, and before the Bible Answer Man broadcast, I always pray. Oh, okay. And I'm not going to tell you the secret about why 11 minutes, because that's probably... Uh, it says more about me than anything else, but it happens to be 11 minutes every single day. But I start, I go on the treadmill. Um, it's probably 15 minutes before the show, and I start praying, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's how I, as it were, take all of the things that I'm dealing with uh -huh. on an organizational, functional level and change my direction upward, my focus upward. Then I pray the Lord's Prayer, the Jesus Prayer, mm -hmm. uh, or the Prayer of Jesus, I should say. Um, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I don't just say it as platitudes. Mm -hmm. You think about when you say hallowed be thy name, yes. my immediate thought is that May what I do on the Bible Answer Man broadcast hallow, bring glory, bring your name the rich esteem it deserves. So each one of those, 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 those phrases are yeah. deeply meaningful to me, and I won't go through all of them, but after I've done that, then I pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, first of all, I say, my faith is not in myself. My faith is in you alone. Secondly, I pray, Lord, I worship you alone. I adore you alone. Cast aside all other idols, and we have them. Mm -hmm. oh, Sometimes yes. we don't know, but we yes. have them. And then I confess my sins. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I realize with David that a broken and a contrite heart, oh God, you will not mm -hmm. despise. And then I find I'm a very thankless person. You know, God just answers one prayer mm -hmm. and I forget about that and I've got something else to ask about. Yeah, yeah. So I thank God for his many blessings. And then, then I have an opportunity to bring my supplications. Mm -hmm. I pray about my health. I pray that the Lord will use the broadcast, not by might nor by power, but by his prayer. A constant prayer. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're gifted like you are, um, as a writer, as a speaker, um, you can very easily fall into the trap of relying upon your own gifts. Mm. Um, but we can be eloquent. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we can be articulate. 
but we can't change anybody's heart. No. So we pray that the Holy Spirit will change hearts. So I have this routine, as it were. Yes, it's a and very it's repetition. yielded, very yielded kind of a prayer. But the repetition is what makes it deeper and deeper. Exactly. It keeps it honest, doesn't it? I guess that's the danger with repetition is it can become superficial. I mean, some people say the, the, our Father, the Lord's Prayer, and they don't even think about the words. They're just kind of running through it. But if you can both repeat it and let it be profound, it can get deeper and deeper every day of your life. Yes. And then you start yearning for it. Yes. Because yeah, what, for it. what are we hungering for? We're hungering for being brought into the presence of God. And uh, we treat people uh, no different uh, than we treat God. Uh, uh, we want intimacy without the investment of quality time. You know, when we pray mm -hmm. before our knees have ever hit the ground, we're already thinking about getting back into our frenzied lifestyle. <laughs> but what did Jesus talk about when he talked about it? Jesus yeah. talked about often withdrawing to lonely places. These are the words of Luke. Oh, yeah. Often withdrawing to lonely places to pray. Why? Because he treasured fellowship with his heavenly Father. And that's the whole deal. We have the opportunity. We're made in the Imago Dei, in the image and likeness of God. We're icons. Yes. We have the opportunity to be brought into the fellowship of the Trinity. I mean, this is the great difference, let's say, between Islam and, and, and Christianity. In Islam, you have a Unitarian God. A Unitarian God, independent of the universe, is a morally defective God because a Unitarian God has no one to love. Mm, that's true. Love always requires a lover, a beloved, a lover. and even a witness. And, 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 and so prior, now I'm, I'm using these words loosely because time did not exist, but independent of the universe, God was completely self-sufficient, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And yet, in the wonder of of the world. He has brought us, he has created us for intimacy, for fellowship within fellowship the Trinity. Hank, you know, you totally, you're fooling me because I, I read on the internet that you left the Christian faith. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound like it. It, you, it, doesn't, it doesn't sound like becoming Orthodox. It was a profound change in some ways, and in other ways it was just a continuation of the, the deep foundation you had been laying every day of your life. You know, I think, um, you, you said something to me last night when we had dinner. Mm -hmm. You said it's uh, very unusual for a man in his 60s to suddenly change. <laughs> yes. And uh, I, God has, no credit to me, God has placed me in a situation where I have to be a perpetual learner. Uh, so I get asked questions on the Bible Answer Man yeah. broadcast, and I think, wow, that's a great question. I'm not sure exactly how to answer that question. And mm -hmm. uh, so I have to tell people I'll research and return. But in that process, you learn, and then you become an ever more useful tool mm -hmm. in the hands of the Holy Spirit. And, and I suppose that this was part of my transition. It was, it, it, it was constantly wanting to learn. I had experienced orthodoxy in a lot of places. I experienced orthodoxy in, in Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, I experienced orthodoxy in Greece, on Mount Athos. I experienced orthodoxy uh, in Kiev, in the Ukraine, mm -hmm. in the West Bank, I name a lot of other places. There's always a language barrier. Yes, yes. So I didn't really know exactly what was going on. But when I experienced orthodoxy in my own backyard, mm -hmm. I started understanding what was going on. I was thrown into that treasure chest. I was thrown into that, that repository of, uh, of jewels, as yes, it were. Yeah. Hey, I think about the uh, uh, King, King Solomon saying, how blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man mm -hmm. who gains understanding. Its profit is better than the profit of silver, and its gain than fine gold. She's more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire compares with her. So, That's back wisdom. to the point. Yeah, yeah. it's wisdom. So, so what we have to do, and this is, this is the point I think we're driving at. I think sometimes we don't like what we don't know. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Right? So, so, so once I actually went to an Orthodox church, I didn't know what to expect. 
um, because it was all Greek to me, as it were. It was all Russian to me. It was all, you know, uh, Slavic to me. It was all in different language. But once I went to an Orthodox church, once you heard church, it in English, I actually walked and I heard it in English. I was, I, I, I was quite, I was quite touched. And I remember going out for the fellowship bread, and um, one of the fathers. Mm-hmm. Uh, said to me, are you Hank Hanegraaff? And I said, yes. He said, wow. He said, uh, your ministry has had an impact on my life. Oh, then I walked into the there. fellowship hall and I uh, ran into an African-American guy. One of the, I've gotten to know him since, and one of the just sweetest people I've ever met. He walked up to me and said, you know, I used to listen to you when I drove a truck. And uh, I came to faith in Christ as a result. So I, why do I tell that story? I tell that story because I found God's people in the Orthodox mm-hmm. Church. But God has his people everywhere. everywhere. I've yes. traveled all over the world and recognized that God has his people everywhere. So this is not about mm-hmm. the Orthodox faith saying, Unless you are Orthodox, you have no hope whatsoever of, of eternal life. You explain this probably more beautifully than anyone. Uh, the real issue is, do you love Jesus? Are you like Abraham? Are you a friend of God? Oftentimes, and I've said this in the Bible, Answer Man, Prize, it's not the absence of truth mm-hmm. that damns. It's the despising of truth that dams. So I was opened up to a repository. Now I have to figure out what am I going to do with that? I was all of a sudden confronted with the Eucharist. What am I going to do with that? Um, am I going to ignore the weight of church? What am I? So all of a sudden I was challenged and you know I have said I will do whatever is necessary to follow truth wherever it leads. And that's the path that I'm on. Uh, But you said it perfectly. This is not a repudiation of 24 or 25 books. No, it isn't. Now, I will tell you that I'm learning a whole lot. And there's a certain humility when you learn, you realize, wow, I could have said that a little better. I can imagine a lot of Orthodox people listening to me and thinking, You know, he's got a lot to learn. Um, and, and, and that's absolutely true. Um, I, have not, uh, I have not attained. I'm, I'm in the midst of this joyful journey learning about, well, what was the only church up until the Great Schism in 1054? Yes, yeah, that's so true. And I guess the question many Orthodox would have is, well, why did you walk into an Orthodox church in the first place? And I think it goes back to, um, of all things, you running across the concept of deification, union with God in this life, that God intends for us to partake of the divine nature. He intends for us to be one with him. Deification or uh, theosis. Um, those, are, those terms can sound scary if they sound like weird, mystical, and like we think we're going to become little you know, deputy gods with our own little universes. But it just means like uh, that, that poker put in the fire that takes on the energies, the heat, and the light of the fire. Um, discovering or running into that concept of deification and coming to believe that it truly was biblical and that it was a piece that had been missing from your understanding. I think that is what led you, is it not, um, to first walk in the door of an Orthodox church? Uh, two things. Mm-hmm. Um, I, yes, absolutely what you're saying is true. Uh, interestingly enough, there's a, a group in China, um, started by Watchman Nee. Um, you could go to China today, there may be 100 million Christians there. Many, many of those Christians trace their roots back to Watchman Nee. And Watchman Nee had a profound sense of, of deification, um, of being a God-man. And this was very much misunderstood in the West, particularly yes. by the Christian Research Institute, of which I'm president. And we're a fountainhead of misinformation on what they really believe, because they never believed that we could become God as God is in the Godhead. They never believed, as the Mormons do, that we can become gods and have our own planets. They never believed that God was once a man and now sits enthroned in yonder heaven. So they didn't have an improper anthropology with respect to humanity, nor a misconception of who God is. 
Uh, so I encountered theosis when we were doing a primary research project on Watchman Nee and his progeny. Mm. Very important, again, because there are millions and millions of people in what is called the Lord's Recovery. They call it the Lord's mm. Recovery for a reason, because they're trying to recover truth that has been lost in evangelicalism or Protestantism um, and, and, and was part of the ancient church. This concept of theosis. That's yes. what they've rediscovered, so to speak. Yes. And CRI, your organization, really you know, went to, went to bat to knock them down and say how wrong they are. And then you realized you were wrong and you apologized and, and, and recognized that this concept of theosis actually is biblical. And it's a huge deal because in the West it was an embarrassment. Mm. Um, families sometimes broke up. It was uncomfortable. But in the East, uh, people died as a direct result of bad information. And I, I, I think we have to stop for a moment and, 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 and see the gravitas of yes. that. You know, we live in an age in which internet lies travel halfway around the world before truth has had the chance to put its boots on. And, and, and we have to realize that what we say really makes a difference. Now, in, in, in the case of our information getting into the hands of authorities in China, particularly yes. during the Cultural Revolution, and even thereafter, there was a great persecution in, in, in 1983. We, we, we became the fountainhead of misinformation back in the mid-70s. But it had a direct impact on the lives of people. Of all the issues that we had problems with when it came to the Lord's recovery, they, uh, sometimes it's called the local churches, it was on this very matter. As a result of our primary research, we ended up having to say we were wrong. I didn't want to sweep it under the rug. Yeah. But the primary issue that I was looking at was theosis. And, and that actually, in kind of a roundabout, circuitous fashion, led me into orthodoxy. But I'll tell you one other thing, and I think this is important as well. I, I think another thing that was driving me was I had come to a place of being disillusioned. Hmm. Disillusioned in the sense that Christianity particularly Western Christianity, had become so consumeristic. Yes. Yeah. It became such an imitation of the world. You know, go to church and you'll have a prettier girlfriend. Go to church and it's good for business relationships and networking. In essence, Christ became a means to an end as opposed to Christ being the end. People coming to the master's table, not because they love the master, but because of what is on the master's table. And this is a prescription for disaster. Um, I often say classes and masses produce flashes and ashes. <laughs> Meaning that you have so many people that are flooding into the front doors of mega churches. Yes. And, and they're there, uh, the, the music excites them, the message may excite them, whether it's pop psychology or not, whether it's a rock band with uh, smoke uh, uh, streaming out of machines. All of that excites them, but it doesn't have holding power, it doesn't have right. staying right. power. Staying power comes when you are not being entertained, staying power comes when you worship God. And to this day, when I walk into St. Nectarius and I open those massive cathedral doors, very, very heavy cathedral doors, something flips in my mind. I see the icons. I smell the incense. I hear the bells. I hear the chanting. And immediately, my thought is, I am not here to get something. Yes. I'm not here to get a good sermon. I may get a great homily, yes. a great sermon, but I'm not here for that. I, I, I'm not here to be entertained, moved by music, although I will be moved. Yes, that's true. But I'm here to worship God. And this is the great 
mystery. The great mystery is when you take yourself and say, I am no longer about self-entertainment. I'm not here to try to imitate the world, a cultural imitator. I'm here to worship God. Now you fulfill the very thing you were created for. We were created to be icons of God. We were created to be those that have fellowship with God. And until we have that, Pascal, of course, talked about that God-shaped vacuum, we're empty. The baubles of life will continue to entice us. So what am I saying? There's a disillusionment. You see people flooding in the front doors of of mega churches, and you say, wow, this is an accessible formula. And oftentimes it is a formula. You know exactly how to get butts into seats. Uh, But the thing you don't see is the people falling out the back door. Yes. There's enough people coming in the front door. You don't see the people falling out the back door. But the people falling out the back door have a huge, huge problem, particularly millennials. Mm -hmm. They're looking for authoritative and authentic. They fall out the back door. They say, yeah, this was a liver quiver. This was an experience. Mm -hmm. This was, but I'm still not satisfied. We're never satisfied until we experience theosis, until we experience union with God. And there are many ways in which the graces of God are given to us. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a whole different lectionary here. I mean, we use That's the true. word grace in one sense within Protestantism. Uh, you use grace in another sense within Roman Catholicism. Mm-hmm. You use grace in another sense within Orthodoxy. Mm-hmm. Uh, a grace is not transactional. No, no. It's, uh, and it's not a creation. It's the presence of God coming to us. It it's that presence. direct. It's that direct. It's, a, it's not like, you know, I'm ill, so I'm going to pay my doctor a bribe, and then he will arrange things so I can get well. It's, I go to my doctor, and he gives me medicine that makes me well. It's direct. There's not any moment of payment or merit or bargaining. It is that the Father loves us, and he wants us to be healed and to be with him. Which is one of the great misconceptions. I mean, I hear all the time that I have now entered a works-oriented yeah. religion. And uh, one of the beauties in, 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 in reading the Church Fathers, um, in reading Church history, in, in reading about the Eastern Church, is that you immediately grasp something. And that is, uh, uh, there's no dichotomania. Mm-hmm. It's not as though you're setting faith up against works as though one is in opposition to That was a pernicious idea, wasn't it? It was, once that idea crept in, people couldn't stop seeing it. It was was impressed on their memory, but it really didn't have reality behind it. That we know in our experience, you love the Lord, you're drawn to the Lord, and you want to keep making your life a little bit more like His. You want to bear His presence a little bit more because you love Him, because you yearn for Him. Because you're thirsty and he is the living water, and because you're in darkness and you want the light. So there's no concept whatsoever of earning salvation. Everything in salvation, from the beginning to the end, it's all the work of God. But as we have all this middle in between, as one of the Desert Fathers said, between the beginning, the moment of faith, and the end of our lives. There's this middle in between. What are you going to do moment by moment? Keep yearning for him and keep yearning for his presence and trying our best to conform ourselves to him and to incorporate his life in us. Yeah, I mean, it's a difference between living as a baptized secular humanist. You know, you got baptized and you made your transaction, you said your prayer, and uh, living a life that is to the full. I oftentimes say today, Christ not only saved us by his death, he saved us into his life. We have the the engrafted life of Christ. Um, This is not merely a changed life. Mm -hmm. This is an exchanged life. It is the life of Christ within. And so however long, you know, I think about my own mortality and uh, certainly with my diagnosis, I mean, that's uh, something that is never too far from my 
my memory, but, but, but I think, look, this is not about somehow or other getting to heaven. It is enjoying Christ in the present. And uh, I, I deeply, deeply enjoy the presence of God. I, Frederica, I could not endure what I'm enduring today without the presence of God. It comforts me. It gives me joy. I'm able to pass that joy mm -hmm. on to others. Uh, we were talking last night about the fact that uh, one of my favorite uh, passages in Scripture is uh, just just a little, it's, it almost seems like a throwaway statement if you don't really get into it, but it's where the Lord Jesus Christ says in the Sermon on the Mount, do not worry about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So now, why do I want to stay here? Mm -hmm. Why do I want to be healed? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you think about it, what we do now counts for all eternity. Mm -hmm. So I want to lay up for myself, as Jesus said, treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be That's also. Right. So I want to have more years of fruitful service. Mm -hmm. So if I pray, and sometimes I picture myself touching the hem of Jesus' mm -hmm. garment and having... Uh, the, the, the flow of uncreated energy yeah. uh, uh, flowing into my body, healing me. Uh, at other times, I think, you know what, maybe the Lord has a, a completely different purpose for me. Uh, I, I started getting very visible on Facebook, and oh, yeah. thanks to my son David, he's mm -hmm. gotten me into the digital media, media platform. But, 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 but what am I interested in here? I'm interested in taking people along the journey and saying Christ is sufficient. One of the most poignant uh, uh, scenes I've probably ever seen, um, it's a scene I'm sure you're familiar with, The Hiding Place. Oh, yes. Yeah. And you have Betsy Ten Boom. She's dying. I think she's laying somewhere in a communist, uh, uh, not communist, Nazi. The, the Nazi. Yeah. A prison camp, and 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 she's laying on a bed, and she's saying to her sister, Corrie Ten Boom, she's saying, "Please tell the people." And she said this in her Dutch brogue. I happen to be Dutch. Mm -hmm. There is no pit so deep that he is not deeper still. And when it comes from someone who has gone Just through every agony. Yeah. That means something. That means something. That means that the sea in Christ is far bigger than the sea in cancer. It means that whether we're here, I'd like to be here another at least 20 years. My mother's 91. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I'd, I'd like to be here for another 20 years. And, and I have a good prognosis. I mean, I have to go through some difficult times, but um, the chances of me going into remission are actually quite good. Yes. Um, uh, I have to go through the bone marrow uh, yes. transplant. I have to go through the chemo. I have to go through all of that, and I'm doing that right now. But whether I live or whether I die, I am the Lord's. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Either way, you win. Either way, you win. Something that touched me very much yesterday, we were, we were talking, and one of your friends who's Protestant was here, and I was touched as I realized one of the things he said or just alluded to. Uh, he said something sort of like, so you believe that people outside the Orthodox Church can be saved? And I thought, oh, how sad. <laughs> how sad to have thought that you or I would ever think that only Orthodox are saved. I think that what the Orthodox Church brings is is the gymnasium, is the wisdom of 2,000 years of trial and error of knowing how to get closer to Christ, how to pray, how to perceive his voice more accurately, how to be safe, how to know when it's demonic delusion or it's, or it's your own self-delusion. It is the gymnasium, it's the workout space. And of course, that's for everybody. It's I, I like to say we all go back to the early church. Yes. You know, it's not the Orthodox Church does not have the copyright on that. 
Now, I would always encourage people that if you're going to do the program, I think it's better to do the whole program. I think it's better to become Orthodox and to have these sacraments and not have other theologies mixing in with Orthodox theology. I just think that's more efficient, we might even say. But it's not like you can't be saved outside of this. And if, you, if all you can do is pick up a piece of it, pick up the, the fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays, which I should say is not you don't eat any food, but it's keeping a vegan diet on yeah. those days. Just pick up the Jesus prayer. Get that ancient icon of the Christ of Sinai. Put it in your house somewhere. Um, if you just pick up a little bit, it will help you. It will help you on this journey to union with God. Um, it certainly is not the case that we think you can't be saved outside the church. I love the good thief. I always think of the good thief who's... You know, probably if, if the Bible answer man was there to question him from the foot of his cross and scrutinize his theology, he would not have succeeded. He didn't know anything except that he loved the Lord Jesus and he cried out to him for help. Yeah. That is salvation, loving the Lord and crying out to him for his help. It's kind of interesting. Um, reading the headline Monday morning after I was chrismated, uh, one of the headlines was the Bible answer man um, leaves the Christian faith. And, and, and I think if you turn that around a little bit, um, I do not look at my evangelical friends, and I have many of them, I don't look at them as having lost the faith or left the faith. And most of them really don't see me as leaving the faith. I remember a past president of the uh, the Southern Baptist Convention calling me up not long after I was chrismated and uh, saying to me, you know, Hank, um, I don't know a whole lot about orthodoxy, and I think that's part of the problem. He said, I don't know a lot about orthodoxy, but I know you, and I know you don't go off half-cocked, and I know that truth matters to you. And, and so it does. But again, the moniker of our ministry has changed from truth matters to life matters more. I don't want to mistake, as I said earlier, the cradle for its occupant. Yes. I have an opportunity to have intimacy with the living Lord of the universe, the one who knit me together in my mother's womb, the one who spoke and the limitless galaxies leapt into existence. Yes. I mean, you think about the immensity of God. Uh, you think about the universe itself. We used to say there's 100 billion galaxies, each with 100 billion stars. Now we realize that was really shortchanging the universe. Now we know there are trillions of galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars in each one of the galaxies. So when you think about God, I, 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 I think in orthodoxy you have two different things. One communicated, I love the alliteration, one communicated as the essence of God. God is ineffable yes. in his essence, but he is knowable in his energies. And there's a practical thing that I want people to get. I mean, when the disciples went up... Yes, it's very up, practical, isn't it? Yeah, you go That's about, a surprise. It's not just mystical and vague and words you can't understand. It's eminently practical. It's livable. Yeah, I mean, you, you think about the disciples going up Mount Tabor. Mm. Wow, you talk about a paradigm shift. <laughs> they see Jesus Christ transfigured. Yeah. Uh, they're enveloped in a cloud of energy, mm -hmm. uncreated energy, they have to come down the mountain and say, wow, there's an alternate reality. Yeah. I knew nothing yeah. about whatsoever. And I think in many ways, people are missing this wonderful yes. piece. Yeah. God is ineffable. Like the sun, we can't get into the core mm -hmm. of the sun and see what's going on in the core of the sun. It's unknowable. It's, uh, we, we, we simply can't get right. there. Yeah, yeah. But we experience the energies of the sun, with, with my fair complexion, exactly. I would say yours too. Mm. Um, you're probably Scandinavian too, right? <laughs> um, I was born in Holland. But if I sat in the sun right now for five hours, mm -hmm. you would know I had an encounter with the sun. <laughs> and uh, this, this is the thing I don't want people to miss. You can encounter Christ. You can have an experience yes. with Christ. You are alluding earlier on to... Um, 
to the words of the Old Testament prophet. I was thinking about Jeremiah who said, Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I will not find him, declares the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? On the one hand, you have people who are making their idols so that their God is nearby. Mm. But God fills heaven and earth. Mm. And as you said so beautifully uh, earlier on, mm. God is not a distant God. No. He resides within our being. There's a mingling of God and humanity mm. as a result of partaking of the graces always within the church itself, the ground and the pillar of our faith. It's not apart from that. Christianity was never designed to be a lone ranger sport. No, that's true. So I make my confession. I experience God in the meadow. No, mm. it's always within community that we experience God and receive His graces. So apart from the church, mm. You cannot grow in grace. You cannot experience theosis or union with God. It is always within the community of believers. One of my favorite passages in all the scriptures, Romans chapter 12. That passage alone lets you know that the church can't do without you and you can't do without the church. St. Paul says, be transformed by the renewal of your minds at Romans 12 too. And that it, that's the transformation, that's the metamorphosis, that's the metanoia, the change of the mind, the change of the turning to repentance that transforms us. And it does happen within the church. And I think it, it can sound like we're saying, I was raised Roman Catholic and I was taught that anybody who did not have a Roman Catholic baptism would go to hell. That there was no means of salvation apart from Roman Catholic baptism. And, that's not, that's not what we're saying when we talk about it. It's rather that this is the human life is a long process of healing. We have much further to go than we need, or than we know about, much further to go than we know about. And um, if you want to be healed, come to the church because the church is the hospital. The church is the workout, you know, the, the gymnasium. It has what you need. And if you can only use a few of those, you know, exercise machines, then do that at least. But, as for me, I'm so glad that my husband led our family into orthodoxy 25 years ago, and I've been able to participate in every aspect. Now that reminds me of another question, which is so often, as was the case with my family, my husband went to an orthodox Vesper service, came home, he loved it, he was crazy about it. The next Saturday night, I went with him, I went to the service, came home, I didn't like it at all. I thought, this is weird, this, I don't like this music, and I don't know, you know what the priest is doing. There are these doors, and he comes in and out of the doors, and I, I just, it, it did not attract me. And it took me a while. In fact, I finally had to get to the point after like a year and a half and say, I don't get it, but I'm not going to fight you. Uh, you lead, I will follow. I believe, I believe that you see something that I don't see, but I believe that you see something. So I'm going with you. Now, I wanted to ask, what was this like in your family? Your, your dear wife, Kathy, has become somebody I love very much. And 12 children. How did this, how did this hit your family when you were, began to be attracted to orthodoxy? This is really interesting. <laughs> so I tell Kathy and I tell the kids, go to church. I'm exploring. Mm. Go to, go to the other church. I'm going to go exploring. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'm thinking in my mind, you know, what are the possibilities? Mm -hmm. And I finally think, you know, I ought to, I ought to uh, Google um, an Orthodox church because, as I said earlier on, uh, I had experienced Orthodoxy, but always with the language barriers. So I Googled a church, and it was St. Nectarius, and it was, turned out, pretty close to my house. And... Uh, so I went to St. Nectarius, and um, I already explained the wonderful experience I had the first day. Then I went the next week. Then I went the next week. Then I went the next week. Fourth week, um, my wife and kids barred the door. <laughs> and they said, we're going with you. And I said, oh, you are not <laughs> going with me. They said, no, we're going with you. Oh. And I said, no, you're not going with me. 
And they said, no, we want to go with you. I said, no. Well, you know, Kathy and you know my kids. <laughs> yes. they, they all love you. And, and uh, they've gotten to know you. Well, they're very persuasive. Mm. So I, I, I finally said, you know what? I'll let you go. Mm. As though I was letting my wife do anything. <laughs> right. um, I'll let you go under one condition. I'll go back to the office. And I want to run something off for you to read. Read that first. Once you've read it, then come with me. So they agreed. I went back to the office. Frederica Matthews Green has this wonderful little primer. I have 12 things I wish I'd known. (laughs) And so I take that back. They read it. Mm -hmm. They go to church with me. Yeah. And... um, you know, when you are married for a long time, you can almost sense what your wife is going to say. Yes. And I thought when the service was over mm-hmm. and I asked Kathy, what did you think? Mm-hmm. I could hear her. I mean, it was, like a, it was like an audible voice in my head. I could hear her say, get me out of this place. <laughs> um, I, I could just hear her well, say that. So I ventured, mustered the courage, mm-hmm. ventured the question. And she said, I loved it. And so we went the following week. And the following. There was so much mystery there. Why the icons? Mm-hmm. What is iconography? What, what, yes. what, what is that really? I mean, are these graven images? Exactly, uh, yes. That's yeah. very alarming to a lot of people. Alarming. What is this? What is this? This incense, incense going on, mm-hmm. uh, you know, of course, I uh, immediately, my mind flashed back to what Paul, uh, John said, golden bowls full of incense. incense. These the are the prayers of the saints. Yeah. Uh, what are the, and one of the things that is so beautiful about this, on the one hand, it's uh, ugly in the sense of misconception. Mm-hmm. On the other, it is beautiful in that God is using within the Orthodox Church earthly, perceptible, tangible realities mm-hmm. to tell us the story. Yes. To tell us yes. the story. You said to me the other day, uh, that essentially icons mm. are a picture Bible. It's the picture Bible, just like the one I had for my children when they were very small. Yeah, and then the more you start learning about the icons, the more you start learning that there are little... Uh, when I was in Greece, I started learning about you know the configuration of the fingers and why... Yes. There's, there's a science and an art there that is, is, is like unto hermeneutics, the art and science of biblical interpretation. Exactly. You learn to read an icon. Yeah, you learn to read an icon. There's steps there. And then you start wondering, wow, what am I doing when I'm making the sign of the cross? Mm-hmm. Why would I do that? Uh, wh- wh- why am I venerating an icon? And have I crossed the line between veneration and worship? You know, yeah. in the Revelation, when the angel shows John the vision, John falls down and begins to worship him. And the angel says, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers of the prophets. Worship mm-hmm. God. And so you start asking questions, and one of the things you find out when you start asking questions is, wow, did I have a bunch of mis- yes. <laughs> misconceptions about what is going on? And I think that's really what we have to mm-hmm. ultimately try to break the barrier of. It is the barrier of misconception. One of uh, my friends said to my son when he read in the paper that I had been uh, chrismated, he said, so your dad's become an idol worshiper. <laughs> and, 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 and my son was really, um, Hank Jr., he, he didn't take it very well. No, um, but, 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 but again, this is the barrier you have to break That's through. Right. You have to break through that barrier. You see Mary, Theotokos. Mm. In Protestantism, we talk about Mary and we say, you know, Mary was a sinner. just like, She has the same broken gene we have. Yeah, yeah. But that fails to tell the whole story. There was a woman who was deceived. Mm -hmm. And all of humanity suffered the effects of sin. Mm -hmm. Creation itself groans in travail. But in the fullness of time, Mm -hmm. there was another woman. Mm -hmm. She wasn't deceived. She was a woman who conceived, and she conceived 
Christ. And, 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 and when you stop and try to get your mind around this, it's easy. The words fall off my tongue. When you try to get your mind around yes, the infinite God being conceived in the... It's, it's, and then you start realizing, wow, in the fullness of time, there is one person mm. through whom God becomes incarnate, comes yes. in flesh, And then you start to gradually appreciate, well, she was a sinner just, no, you start to appreciate that God is preparing Mm -hmm. a vessel, Mm -hmm. a lowly, a humble vessel to be filled with him. And that then becomes the ultimate icon. It becomes Mm -hmm. the ultimate this is what I want. I want I want to be like Mary. Yes. I want to be like Theotokos. I want to be like Mary in that she was Godized. She was yes. filled with God. Yes. I want to be filled with God. And so the one thing you end up with when it's all said and done mm-hmm. is laughter when anyone says that the Christian faith is patriarchal. <laughs> Because the person we most want to emulate Mm -hmm. is the humble, Uh lowly, perfected vessel through whom God came into the world. Yes, yeah. We have a, you know, when you look at an Orthodox altar, you see a woman. You see a woman holding a baby. And how, um, you know, in most cultures in the world, that's a very vulnerable thing, a young woman with a baby in her arms. And yet she is held up as our, our leader, our champion leader, as if she's the, the general in the fight against sin and death. She's, the, she's our worship leader, you know. She teaches us to pray. My soul magnifies the Lord. She's our example. Mm. It can't be a patriarchal religion if the primary example of a human that we're supposed to follow is the Theotokos herself. And you think about the women that were the first to mm, discover the, first to the to empty the tomb. tomb. Yeah, yeah. The first preachers, really. Yeah. They went back and gave the good news to the yes. apostles, and the apostles doubted them. Yes. Or St. Fotini, the name of the woman at the well is Fotini. And uh, she went on to preach the gospel and ultimately to be martyred and to die for her faith. Um, but there she is. She goes, goes to the city and she says, he told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? She's preaching Jesus Christ, the first preacher of Jesus Christ, even before his death and resurrection. And the main message. Yes. The yeah. main message, Christ yes. is risen. You know, when I... Uh, was chrismated, I, I, I changed my salutations and my letters mm, mm-hmm. from uh, blessings to yeah. Christ, Christ is risen. Is risen. That, is the, that is such a um, very significant ultimate truth in orthodoxy. And I think it's, it's one of those little ways that the emphasis is different in the West because in the West there's so much emphasis on Jesus on the cross pays the Father the debt we owe for our sins. But in the East, the emphasis is rather that because of sin, we have been taken captive by the evil one. The the, um, biblical analogy or foreshadowing is Pharaoh in Egypt, who is holding the people captive. And that Jesus goes into hell, and he defeats the evil one. And then we are set free, like the Israelites on the shores of the Red Sea. He opens the way for us. So there's, there's no question of merit. There's no question of earning anything. We are, we are totally helpless, helpless in sin. And the Lord leads us through. The Lord sets us free. 